If you are going to wage modern warfare, you need power and material and industrial installations. And that's exactly what was in the Ruhr Valley during World War II. And the only way to really stop all that production of material was to break the dams and hence the term Dam Busters, a movie and a book by Ted Barris. Ted is on the other side of the screen. Welcome back, Ted. A pleasure, Alan. Nice to see you again. Uh, tell me in, in brief terms, what was so important about the Ruhr Valley? I mean, the, the statistics you go into in the book are really staggering. It, it was really an important area, right? It was the heart of the German industrial military development process. Uh, essentially, the river, its strength, powering through the dams. The dams had been built uh, around 1900 to 1910. They were longstanding, uh, mostly in those years, as resorts. The, the reservoirs that were created by the damming of the river um, created wonderful areas for Germans on the weekends and in the summertime to vacation by the water. There were boats and parks and all that sort of thing right up to the beginning of the war. Um, but the more practical application, like in Canada, was water power to generate electricity. So in every one of those dams, and there were dozens of them, several more important than, the, than others, the Mona and the Ader and so on, um, was to essentially uh, create electricity, which was then lined not too far away to the industrial plants for the creation of weaponry and steel um, and all kinds of munitions. It was literally, the river was the artery delivering the blood to the heart of the production of, of the German war machine, the Nazi war machine. So, so are we talking about trucks and tanks and planes and, and things all being made there? Well, essentially the steel for them. So you would have to have um, an extraordinary amount of power to, uh, to smelt, to melt, to create the, the, to go from the iron ore that would come there to create the steel to make the weaponry. And so essentially that was the, the source of it. And it was recognized right from even before the war as a potential target. Um, in 1937, a man named Barnes Wallace, whom we'll talk about, um, was part of a committee that was struck by uh, Bomber Command and the Admiralty and all of the strategists who were recognizing that a war was coming because remember Hitler had taken over in Germany in 1936. In 1937, there was this committee to look at the dams as potential targets to essentially cripple that production, the billions and billions of, of tons of water that generated uh, megawatts and megawatts and megawatts of power was an objective. The problem was they were virtually impregnable. How do you get there? How do you bring down such massive structures in one fell swoop? And that was the, the problem that this committee that Barnes Wallace as an engineer, a mere engineer was part of, but he came up with that technique, technique ultimately to um, have a crack at them. Well, if I'd have been on his committee and he would have been mad to have me on it, but I would have said, well, drop a great big bomb on top of the, uh, the dam. Why wouldn't that work? Well, it's interesting, and, and the movie that came out in 1955 um, and shows Barnes Wallace uh, sort of explaining his theory to a friend, and he has a diagram and he lays it out in front of him and he shows, he says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said, he said, we need a 10,000 pound bomb to be dropped from 40,000 feet, and he sketches it on the little diagram, right next to the dam and literally to come down on the water side and shatter the bomb with an, ex shatter the dam with an, an explosion. Well, there wasn't a 10,000 pound bomb that existed. There wasn't an aircraft to deliver a bomb from 40,000 feet. And there was nobody on the planet who could deliver a bomb so accurately as to rub next to the dam underwater to cause the explosion to bring the dam down. He was dreaming in Technicolor. Now I'm, I'm guessing that with, with, the, with the water pressing up against the dam, the force of the explosion uh, could break the face of the dam as opposed to missing the top of it or something. Is, is that what that was all about, is to, is to get the explosion to occur underwater and, and have its force exerted on the face of the dam? You're exactly right in terms of the location and the force. But what Barnes Wallace discovered 
in the 1930s was it wasn't a matter of destroying the dam with an explosion, but he suddenly sensed and found out the details from an experience and an example right in his own backyard that would not blow the dam down, but shake it down. What he recognized, he, he managed to trip over some interesting construction that was going on on a bridge in London. One of the famous uh, bridges that crosses the Thames was being developed, broadened, uh, strengthened, widened. And they were having a problem with the building of this bridge. This would be back in the 1930s, maybe 31, 32. And somebody had done some forensics on the problem. The problem they had was they had these concrete piles, essentially long concrete poles and the poles were being driven down through the Thames River mud, down to the bedrock beneath the mud. And as they pounded that concrete pylon down through the mud, and when it hit the bedrock, one five hundredth of a second later, the vibration coming back up through the concrete on the rebound shattered the concrete pole. When they did the forensics on it, they realized, and hence, uh, Barnes Wallace did in a study of the forensics, a very interesting property of concrete. It can take tremendous um, pounding. It can take compression. That is the banging on the top of this concrete pole. What it couldn't withstand was the resulting vibration or tension in the rebound. And so literally what Barnes Wallace discovered was if you can weaken concrete in this fashion, the same way that the concrete is linking together the bricks and the stones and the dam. If you can weaken the concrete with an earthquake bomb, is what he called it, then the water pressure you described right up against the face of the dam in the billions of tons of water would literally push through that weakened concrete and drive a hole through the dam. An earthquake, not an explosion. Okay, so and I assume someone had thought, well, let's send, send in some commandos and they'll plant a charge, and that wasn't on because there were a lot of German troops there at the time, right? Absolutely, and the dams were highly guarded. In fact, up to mm, literally weeks before the dams raid, coincidentally, there were a lot more guns defending the dams than was the case on the night of the raid in May of 1943. Um, because the bomber command bombers had been targeting the Ruhr, not just the dams, but other locations, the industrial cities like Essen and so on, um, when uh, Arthur Harris was um, locating these, these places for big bomber raids, thousand bomber raids in uh, February and March of 1943, the Germans relocated guns that had been positioned on and around the dams, took them away from the dams and took them to become anti-aircraft and defensive um, weaponry against the bombers around the cities because they figured that the dams were not gonna be attacked. Who would dare attack the dams um, and how would they do it? Well, the only thing they feared, and this was part of the technique that Barnes Wallace evolves, the only thing they feared were torpedoes. If you could drop a torpedo, much the same way as an attack on a ship in the water, the torpedo could go to the ship and explode on impact and ultimately, if it were the dam, erode it to, to, to destroy it by explosion. What the Germans simply did to defend the dams was to lay torpedo nets in the water some distance from the dam on the water side to prevent a torpedo attack. So by stopping torpedoes, the Germans figured the dams are safe. Okay, so you can't torpedo them, and that was a technology that existed. You could drop torpedoes from planes. You couldn't send in uh, the SAS, and uh, you couldn't drop a big bomb on top of the dam because you'd probably miss it. Okay, so what do they decide you have to do? Well, what he decides is somehow he has to get a bomb to go over top of the nets. In other words, to stay on the surface of the water. He's got to get a bomb that in some shape or other will maybe bounce or skip or spin or something and get over the torpedo nets and then get to the water side of the dam and not over the dam because it's useless after that. Just get to the dam on the water side when there is the most water in the reservoir in the spring in May and have that bomb right up against the back of the dam sink, still touching the dam as you described earlier, go to a certain depth and explode because it's sensitive to pressure from the water around it, like a depth charge. 
The idea was to get the bomb, if they could get it to a size of 10,000 pounds, great. Get it to the wall, somehow over the, the uh, nets, have it sink, and like an earthquake, shake the dam down. So that was the, that was the problem he faced. So all you got to do is make a bigger bomb than anyone has ever made before <laughs> that is too big for a Lancaster bomber to carry, make it skip over water, and when it hits the dam, sink down and then explode. That, that's, that's it, right? So how do they do that? Well, when um, Barnes Wallace, an engineer, uh, was considering how to do this, he was mindful of the fact that people have a wonderful... Uh, summertime habit when they're walking along the beach and they're faced with a gorgeous flat lake uh, surface and they see a flat stone to pick it up and to heave it across the surface of the lake. You've done it probably as many times as anybody in your audience has. It, immortalized in uh, the great ro uh, crocodile rock by, uh, by uh, oh boy, um, this is this is like a game show. If if I get the song <laughs> that's skipping, the holding hands and skipping stones, Elton John, Crocodile Rock, I want a prize. Okay, but what's interesting is when I ask audiences, and I've done my talk on the Dam Busters literally hundreds and hundreds of times. I go up to somebody and I say, when you go to the lake in the summertime, you pick up that stone. What do you do? And they generally mimic throwing it in front of me, and I say, okay you probably think that that left hand that you just threw it with is responsible for making that stone skip eight, 10, 15 times, whatever. And I say, if you think that you're wrong, it's not the force of the throw, it's the spinning of the rock. Turns out that Barnes Wallace had a friend who was a cricketer and the cricketers who pitched cricket balls always pitched the balls with spin on it. And they recognized that by spinning the cricket ball, the batter, the batsman, would not have any idea where the hell the ball was going to go, except that when it hit the surface of the dirt in front of the batsman, it would spin and go off even more powerfully in a, in a different direction. So using that technique, Wallace recognizes he's got to have this bomb spin to skip and to propel itself. So he immediately thinks of, OK, what shape is it going to be? The first prototype was a sphere, which he develops and he says, I'd like, he's at um, um, uh, the manufacturing company that's affiliated with aircraft production at this time. Um, and- uh, Is that AV Row? No, it was Armstrong, wasn't that silly? I can't remember. The machine gun manufacturers. Anyway, Vickers, mm. uh, Vickers Armstrong. And he says, I, I want you to build me a spherical bomb that could be 10,000 pounds, roughly 6,000 pounds frame and 4,000 pounds of uh, uh, explosive. And when he goes to the engineers at uh, Vickers and says, I'd like you to, how long would it take? They said, mm, maybe two years. <laughs> this is 1943 or two. They don't have time. And the world is coming to an end. Right, right. So what he decides is let's go to a more traditional, more easily made design and shape and they go to a drum, virtually like a 40 gallon drum, like a cylinder, um, shaped uh, like a cylinder. And if we could get the spinning to work uh, to skip that 10,000 pound bomb to the dam. Okay, so now the problem is uh, building that particular prototype. How do they get it to spin? Because it's gotta spin not just haphazardly, he does through his calculations determine that at a certain speed, in this case, it's roughly 250 miles an hour, which by the way, is the speed to which the newborn Lancasters rolling off the assembly line can reach and they can carry one 10,000 pound bomb because they're able to do that from an altitude. Okay, we got a Lancaster, how do we get it to spin? Well, the Lancasters they get coming off the assembly line have an interesting motor in their bellies. The motor drives the Bombay doors, opens them and closes them. So in order to build the carrying device, a cradle in the belly of the Lancaster that's gonna deliver this 10,000 pound bomb, they remove the Bombay doors. So you've got calipers that come down from the belly of the Lancaster, cradle the 10,000 pound bomb, almost like it's spinning on a spindle. And then they use the motor that was opening and closing the doors 
to spin the bomb, which Barnes Wallace determines has to be spinning backwards, not forwards, at 500 revolutions per minute. Now, this is like um, an Apollo program where people are using, I assume in those days, slide rules, no computers, uh, and figuring out not only the weight of the bomb, the spin, but the height from which it needs to be dropped uh, and the speed at which the plane must be going. And all those things must align perfectly for this to work, correct? Absolutely. Now, would you then describe, you, we, we now have this bomb in the plane because it won't fit in the plane, it's too big. So it's on calipers, they figured out how to spin. Could you please describe the training routine that the dam busters, which of course are the pilots and the others, the scientists, inventors, engineers, the dam busters, what is the training regime they go through to practice how to do this amazing feat? Well, let me give you a bit of context here. When it's decided, and it's a great story as to how they actually get the green light, Barnes Wallace and uh, 617 squadron, which became the Dam Buster squadron, they get the green light to go ahead on this. And ah, they and, and Beaverbrook, uh, Canadian Lord okay, Beaverbrook. Well, we'll, we'll cameo, get, right? okay. Let's go back to Barnes Wallace for a second. So Wallace has got this spinning bomb. The Lancasters is the delivery system. We've got um, the problem that you've alluded to now. How do we know that it's the right height altitude off the surface of the reservoir? And all of this is engineering, which he figures out. He figures out that the, that the bomber has to be 250 miles an hour, the bomb spinning backwards, cylindrical, 500 revolutions per minute. And it has to be not 100, not 40, but exactly 60 feet off the surface of the reservoir, approaching the dam at right angles, okay? He determines that you gotta get it to 60 feet. What they find out is, if you take an Aldous lamp, which is a light, and put one in the belly of the um, Lancaster facing forward at an angle, and another light in the nose facing back at another angle, you can pinpoint, based on the position of those two streams of light or, or beams of light, when the aircraft is 60 feet off the water, okay? So I guess your altimeter wouldn't be that sensitive. You couldn't. They, the altimeters didn't work on water then. They were They nearly ended up in the drink in some of the trials. And we'll get back to the training in a minute. So now Wallace faces the problem uh, or poses this to Guy Gibson, who is leading 617 Squadron. you got to get the aircraft 60 feet off the water. So they come up with this light idea. OK, so now we've got the aircraft traveling at 250 miles an hour comes down from its long trip from England, we'll get into that as to how they got there, and does this uh, low level approach at 60 feet, lining up the dots and getting the bomb to spin. When I was doing a talk very early in the publication, after the publication of Dam Busters, my book, there was a guy in the front row and he was on his computer like a kid in my class on his phone. <laughs> and I leaned down and I said, excuse me, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to figure out how long it would take the bomb traveling at 250 miles an hour and bouncing to get from roughly 800 to 1,000 yards out, which was all the other parameter, to the dam. How long it would take to get that process to happen? I said, I don't know. What did you figure out? He, he actually figured it out on his phone. He said it would take between five and eight seconds, which means everything, Alan, that you and I have been talking about for the last 10 minutes about the physics and the design and the delivery of the bomb had to happen in between five and eight seconds on the approach to the dam or the whole thing was a washout. And okay. I, would, I would guess then the Lank would have to get out of the way pretty quickly. It had about five or eight seconds to get out of the way. Well, you, you're traveling at 60 feet at uh, 250 miles an hour. Um, the detonation of the bomb, if it was delivered properly and hits gently hits the back of the dam against where the water is, and sinks, but doesn't detonate until the uh, depth charge like sensitivity of the bomb uh, occurs some seconds later, the bomber would long have cleared the dam and out of, out of problems, out of harm's way. But now what he's got to do is, the squadron leader brings together um, about uh, 122 men to become the core of 617 squadron to train for this. And he gathers these guys together in late March of 1943. 
he knows squadron leader Guy Gibson, who has been given the assignment of delivering the bombs to the dams, although he doesn't know that the dams are a target yet, because it's all so top secret. He gets these guys together and they now have to train low level over water, over land, without knowing what it is they're going to bomb or when. So they begin this very tedious series of training, uh, what they call cross countries, where you'd go out in a pattern around England and you would cross over water. Indeed, you would go up to a little dam um, northwest of Sheffield uh, and a reservoir uh, north and, and west of where Scampton was, the station from which they were operating. And every day they would travel over this dam without realizing that the dam um, in uh, Germany on the Ruhr, the Mona was very similar to the one that was uh, out there at Sheffield. And they would practice these runs going low level. And they literally started off at about two or 300 feet off the ground in their training exercises. And within the first day, Squadron leader Guy Gibson says, I want all of you to travel at 100 feet or less. And in order to keep you guys honest, I'm going to send out um, observers from the Observer Corps to all the locations you're going to cross during your cross country. And I want you all to remain below that 100 feet or you'll be reprimanded. Because I've got, and I've some got of the eyes are, on you. Some of them are clipping trees while they're doing this aren't they absolutely i mean it's amazing they did this for seven weeks and they did not know that the target was the dam. most of the crews were were savvy enough and had done already at least one tour some of them two tours they knew that the turpitz which was a big german battleship was sitting up in a uh, fjord in norway and they sensed that all of this was designed to do a low-level attack on the turpitz so that's what they had in their minds but in fact, the rhythm of that kind of an attack, whether it's a dam or the turpits, was the same. Well, this is like the old joke. Uh, my work is so top secret, even I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the whole team, uh, at least one of them you document, uh, found out that wasn't it the day of what the target was? Everybody found out the day of. When, in fact, Gibson didn't find out that the target's were the three major dams, the Sorpa, the Ader, and the Mona dams, until probably a couple or three weeks before the actual attack. And this was so top secret that no one was to know until at least the day before when he gave the key uh, commanders of the, they were gonna go over in three waves. And so he brought together the leaders of each of those three waves and spilled the beans on the, 16th of May, 1943, the operation was the 17th of May, 1943, okay? Uh, but for- So on that day, that's when they found out. Now, th th this was a dangerous mission. Many of them didn't come home. Very valuable uh, attack on Germany, took the, took the war to, you know, to the German civilians, really. Uh, but for comedy relief, uh, if you could tell us of the brief tour of the Lancaster that a member of the women's division uh, took. <laughs> well, um, when this training was going on, even the people on the station had no idea what was up. The only people who had the top secret information about target and speed and altitude, the specifics of it was Guy Gibson. Now, as it turned out, there were a lot of people who were close to the activity they saw the bombs in the last days leading up to the raid because they actually had to practice with the bombs spinning and doing the same routes over the, the ground and water that they would ultimately be doing on the trip. So some of the elements were there. And among the people who saw this was a WD. And the WD had a relationship with Guy Gibson. And so on the day they actually were bombing up on the, on the, the day of the raid, um, she actually got the opportunity to go up into the uh, flight deck to the cockpit of one of the Lancasters, I think it was Gibson's uh, Lancaster, and she accidentally trips the bomb uh, to fall out of the calipers. And everyone thinks as it falls from the belly of the, of the Lancaster onto the ground, oh my God, this thing's gonna explode. Well, of course it wasn't because it's sensitive to water pressure, not air pressure. But for a moment, <laughs> there was this horrible moment that the entire thing, I mean, people were scattering. They were so worried that the thing was going to explode, but it was just an accident, which of course 
they recovered from. They simply repositioned the bomb back into Gibson's uh, Lancaster's belly and away they went. Now in, in this training, uh, dropping actual uh, bombs, I guess without explosives in them just to test the system, uh, didn't some of the splashing of the water threaten to bring down the Lancaster? Yes, you and I have talked about the 60 feet and how critical it was that it be at that altitude. You could drop it at 100 feet, but if you did, when the bomb hit the water, it'd be like hitting concrete and it would shatter the bomb in a million pieces. If you dropped it at below 60 feet, they discovered almost to their peril, the splash from the bomb hitting the water and beginning to bounce was so powerful, the plume that literally exploded up behind the aircraft into the tail could knock the tail of the Lancaster off and essentially put the crew in the drink and kill everybody. So this was a, right down to the last moment was a trial and error thing where they literally had to figure out the fine tuning to 60 feet, the fine tuning to 250 miles an hour, the fine tuning of the spinning bomb to 500 revolutions per minute backwards and the, uh, all of the elements to get there were being tweaked right up to the day of the operation. And pretty rudimentary uh, radar, uh, radio communication, maps, and the searchlights from the enemy could blind the pilot. And uh, I'm gathering from your book that they trained with goggles to simulate uh, very poor vision. Yeah, they, um, they used the goggles, which were a certain uh, color. Uh, I think they were yellow. And they screened the inside of the cockpit's um, uh, visor with, a, with also um, uh, film that approximated nighttime vision. So they would work with the same kinds of condition, uh, even if they were flying in day, it looked like night. So that was, that was a sort of an approximation of, of what, everything was designed to give them as close to an actual uh, sense of the attack uh, from the get-go. Traveling at those altitudes, which as you suggested, would bring um, problems if they clipped off some branches, uh, staying at the right altitude, staying at the right speed. I mean, the reason that they were flying, if we should probably indicate clearly here, the reason for the altitude below 100 feet was the Germans had a very effective radar system called Freya, which was located all along the coast of Europe through the Netherlands, through Belgium, through France, down to the Pyrenees and Spain. It was like a blockade. And it was, Freya was wonderful in tracking anything that came towards the shoreline of occupied Europe above 100 feet. Below 100 feet, not so much. So the idea was if they can literally go under the radar, they could travel from Scampton in Lincolnshire in England, all the way to the Ruhr, about two and a half hours, deliver the bombs as we've described. And remember each Lancaster had one bomb, if you do it wrong, you lose, or and some of them got killed in the in the in the process, and then return two and a half hours back to Scampton. The, there I, were nineteen I, Lancasters. There were nineteen I, I, that went out, and eleven came back. Under the radar was necessary to avoid detection, but under but sixty feet was necessary for the right uh, calculation to drop the bomb. So there's a bit of a double purpose there. Absolutely, and you can imagine. And it's relatively well portrayed in the movie that came out in 1955. Um, it, it, you get a sense that if you sneezed and jumped the controls, you could drive your plane right into the water or the ground. Um, a, a number of the pilots whose memoirs and uh, letters I read um, indicated there was a guy named Brown from uh, Moose Jaw. And he remembered flying at such a low level when they went in across the Dutch coastline, they were literally dodging the islands as they went through to the Zuider Zee to make their way to the Ruhr. That's how low they were. And when some of the German gunners along the coastline picked up on them, the trajectory of their guns couldn't go low enough to catch them because they were positioned to shoot up at aircraft flying at very high altitude, which the Lancasters have been doing all through the war. But that altitude below 100 feet, they couldn't bring their guns down far enough to catch them. Well, in effect, you put that in context in your uh, book that they, uh, some pilots were actually flying below sea level yeah. as, as they were going around Holland. And uh, it's uh, Ted Barris speaking when I'm not interrupting him. Uh, and the book is The Dam Busters. 
So Ted, you've taken us to the point where they've got the technical matters correct, the speed, the height, uh, and uh, all the slide rule stuff. They've, you've got a whole bunch of pilots who are used to flying at 60 feet and clipping trees and uh, not sure why they're doing it. So now tell us about the actual raid. Well, the raid begins in the evening, um, just between nine and 10 o'clock. I mentioned earlier that there were three waves. They actually were going to approach the Ruhr Valley from uh, two different directions. One was a fairly direct line from Scampton across the North Sea and uh, across um, an island in Holland called Valkyren and up what essentially was over the Scheldt estuary, past Antwerp and all the way into the Ruhr. The other pathway was farther north and took them through the Frisian Islands, which is where Brown went in and was dodging the islands. The idea was that if they ran into anti-aircraft, and there was a good possibility that they would because some of them spotted the aircraft coming in to a certain extent much too late. By the time they fired up their searchlights and their anti-aircraft, the bombers were already past them. But the idea was to give as many aircraft a chance to get through as possible because you only had 19 bombs and they had to get to at least three different dams. So the operation, uh, these guys take off from Scampton. Now, let, let me just get the, uh, just like in a heavyweight fight, get the, the sides right. You got three dams, you got 18 bombs. And 19. 19, and will one bomb take care of one dam? No, because remember my point earlier that Barnes Wallace makes about shaking, weakening the concrete in the dams. It wasn't gonna take one bomb only, even snug up against the wall to shake the concrete with the tension of the rebound to weaken the concrete. It would take several. And so in okay. fact, the two major dams that were breached, uh, it took three, four, five bombs in the case of the Mona and three at the Ader to do it. So almost no redundancy there. Every bomb had to do its uh, bit. Absolutely. Okay, um, carry, carry on. Okay, so now they leave uh, in these waves <laughs> and um, uh, one of the crews um, was piloted by a guy named Joe McCarthy, no relation to the Senator. Um, McCarthy was a Canadian, an American actually, uh, who had come into uh, training in the RCAF during uh, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And you and I will talk about the book I wrote on that plan on another occasion. But his story is kind of interesting because uh, he being an American and having the skill to fly as, as the war was beginning for the Canadians and the Commonwealth, the Americans weren't in the war. And he had, as a young man in New York, he had um, he'd been a lifeguard to earn enough spending money to go then from New York City out onto the island to an airfield where he could practice and get his pilot's license. And so when the war broke out in 1939, he presented himself to the U.S. Army Air Force as a prospective bomber or fighter pilot. Well, the Americans weren't in the war and they were isolationists. They weren't ratcheting up their air force by any means. And so they said, we're not interested in you. Well, he was so itching to participate and do something. He then found out about a way that he could get to Canada and join the Royal Canadian Air Force. When the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan was sending out a dragnet for instructors and then cadets, and this plan trained thousands and thousands of air crew, they put the call out around the world. Obviously the Commonwealth air crew were coming to Canada to be trained, but they needed people who could become instructors or who were relatively qualified or would have a leg up on the training. Well, McCarthy, Joe, had this pilot's license and he found out about an organization called the Clayton Knight Committee. It sounds like an underground operation, which exactly what it was. Clayton Knight was a famous First World War um, aviator from the United States. And that committee was designed to get qualified pilots and navigators smuggled out of the States, because remember, the Neutrality Act in the United States prevented Americans from participating in the war. It would smuggle pilots and navigators north to the border into Canada to train as pilots and navigators and the rest in Canada. Joe went by way of that underground railroad, if you like, to Canada, got his wings, and then just as he's graduating and going about to go overseas, Pearl Harbor happens. And he's invited to go back to the States. He says, no, I'm gonna stay in the Royal Canadian Air Force. And he does a full tour before Guy Gibson invites him on the operation. So he's one of the pilots who's uh, leading 
the uh, he's going to the uh, the the um, Sorpa Dam, which we'll talk about in a minute because it was slightly different from the Mona and the Ader. So now, Joe's navigator, a guy named um, McLean, is dealing with the problem inside the Lancaster of scrolling maps or using the rather cumbersome maps that we would use in the old days before GPS. You'd, you'd have a car uh, glove compartment with, some, you know, you're driving along. And yeah. they, they, they covered the whole windshield of the car. My mother would hold it out and pick a better route, uh, you know, <laughs> than my father wanted. And that was good entertainment uh, for who we didn't and then, get. We didn't and get anywhere, we're... but it was entertaining. And then somebody would open the window and the damn thing would fly away and so on. Anyway, so McLean was dealing with and the other navigators and they came up with a really different, distinctive, unique way of mastering the problem of handling those maps. Because all of the aircraft were so low to the ground, the corridors along which they would travel going to the dams was quite specific, quite narrow. So they then configured the maps on a scroll and they chopped off the excess map that wouldn't be used. And they put it on a kind of a scroll that you rolled it and it would roll from one direction to the other. And then very neatly in front of the navigator in the darkness and uh, of his navigation position, he could have this scroller uh, rolling out the map as they went across um, Europe to, to the dams. And McLean was faced with, do you wanna do that? Do you wanna use one of these scrolls? And he said, it's a brilliant, contraption, but there's one problem, McLean said. He said, what if you get off course? Suddenly you're lost because that excess map is gone. He said, I'm going to deal with the cumbersome map like your mom in the car because just in case I need it, I want it there. And that decision saved the men on that flight from being killed. And here's why. Joe McCarthy, took his Lancaster to the location. Um, by the way, I should mention too that uh, as they were about to take off in their Lancaster at Scampton, their aircraft developed in a problem. Uh, it had a hydraulic leak. There was one spare aircraft. They bailed out of their, before they took off, they got out of their Lancaster and went to a T for Tommy. They were in Q for Queenie. They went to T for Tommy for their flight, but they had to run to do this to catch up to everybody. Now, did that spare Lancaster, and I read this in the book and I wanted to ask you that, did the spare Lancaster have a bomb in it, have the calipers? Was it all outfitted? Okay, so it, yeah. it was- It was ready to go. It really wasn't. And it spare. wasn't, they could simply uh, load the bomb from Q for Queenie to T for Tommy pretty quickly. In any case, these guys rushed to the second bomber pile aboard and take off. And it's their bomber that they go to the Sorpa. Now the Sorpa, unlike the Mona and the Ader Dam, is not an earthen dam, which is a big, or sorry, not a concrete dam it's, that's, that's got the concrete and, and blocks, it's earthen. Which means that the bomb is going to be dropped, not perpendicular to the dam, but parallel to it. So Joe has to figure out a way of bringing his aircraft down parallel to the bomb, not perpendicular to it, not having the bomb spin, but still have it drop on the water side of the bomb at the Sorpa. And he has to work this all out on the day of the raid because it's only them that he discovers his targets, the Sorpa. Anyway, he does all that. They have the problem with Q for Queenie. They take off in T for Tommy. They get to the location. They get there at about mm, one o'clock in the morning and the whole Sorpa Valley is cloaked in fog. They can't even see the dam. So he's got to do passes to find the thing before he can drop the bomb. He did nine passes over the dam before they did one. And of course you can imagine they're coming in over high ground and in some cases buildings with large superstructures, you hop over the top of the dam, go down to, or the, the town, hop down to where the dam level is, drop your bomb within a thousand or 2000 feet and then get the heck out of the valley before you hit the other side. So Joe does this after nine passes. He's able to see the dam. They drop the bomb, lands perfectly, blows, doesn't breach the dam, but damages it sufficiently. Now Joe's got to get the hell out of there. So he now brings his Lancaster up out of the fog, staying under 100 feet, and they start to head for home based on McLean's navigational positioning. He takes his map, the big bulky one, and he says, head this direction, here are your coordinates, away you go. Now, not long after they leave the Sorpa, Joe McCarthy, who's the pilot, says, McLean, we're now seeing lights ahead of us. What is that? 
and he looks at his map and there's a place ahead of them that's not supposed to be there. What he suddenly realizes is he's lost all of his coordinates because when he went from Q for Queenie to T for Tommy, it's a completely different aircraft. Every aircraft, the steel in it, has an impact on a compass in the aircraft. The way the compass responded to the steel in Q for Queenie was different from the way the compass responded in the T for Tommy. All of his calculations were off by six degrees. So, so north was only sort of north or just a little off north? They were heading to the city of Ham, which was surrounded by anti-aircraft fire. Had they gone there, they'd have been shot down. So now Joe puts the Lancaster at 100 feet off the ground into a circuit until his navigator, McLean, can figure out where the hell they go. They're off the track of the corridors. The full specter of the map allows him to find another way home. Had he not had that, they'd have been totally lost. So now... They're circling as he does the recalibration of how to get home and they get hit. An anti-aircraft shot comes crashing through one of the wings, shatters the Astrodome at the top of the Lancaster and showers poor McLean with shrapnel. <laughs> so not only is he dealing with the stress of getting the Lancaster to the target and trying to recalibrate how to get home, there's shrapnel shrouding his or showering down on top of him. Anyway, he manages to get through this, but that, Joe is concerned that maybe that something wrong with the aircraft. Everybody gets on the intercom. Everybody's fine. They head back across Holland, across the North Sea, and they're on their way to Scampton. Last approach, and Joe lets down the landing gear. He's only got one wheel. The right wheel has been blown away by that shell. He's got to land his Lancaster on one wheel. The old cliche from the movies, <laughs> but this is real life. And now what he does is, and any of your audience who are pilots will respect this, that what you do is you bring the aircraft down. You're talking about a 10-ton aircraft. You bring it down and into an almost stall. In other words, slow it down, coming in over the grass field. It wasn't a, a, a tarmac. It wasn't concrete. You bring it in over the grass field. You're just about to stall it so that it will fall out of the air just inches from the ground, if you like. And then you touch that wheel down with the drop, and then you keep all of your flaps in such a way as to keep the right wing in the air as long as possible as you slow down, then you've got to let the wing down and go into a ground loop without exploding the aircraft in a huge crash. And so he lets the wing down, McCarthy does. He does a huge ground loop around Scampton. The plane comes to a stop and everybody's safe. And McLean signs off on his log the date 17 May 1943, and he puts his signature. And I have an image in the book and in my presentation that shows his signature. It is this the weakest, shakiest signature that McLean ever signed because of what he'd gone through. But he got his guys home. Great story. And typical of what the Canadians did on that operation. Meanwhile, back at the dam, <laughs> what's happening with the dam? Well, the Mona and the Ader were breached. So we now have billions of gallons of water screeching down the valley, wiping out everything in its path. So at those two locations, for better than 100 miles, you're wiping out factories, you're wiping out farms, you're wiping out towns, and you're killing uh, a lot of civilians as well as military people. And unfortunately, many people who had been uh, essentially dragnetted into labor forces they were POWs or they were Dutch civilians or Soviet civilians who are now working in those factories. They were all drowned in the collapse of all those factories. A uh, wall of water 30 feet tall, uh, 100 miles long. Wow. Powerful, powerful. But you know what, Alan, and this is the key to the story. It was not a tactical victory. In fact, the Germans rebuilt the Mona Dam within 76 days. That's how quickly they were able to bring their, their forced labor to bear, to well, rebuild. To now rebuild. I, yeah. I, I know you're used to hosting programs and doing interviews, but let me play too and ask you a question about exactly that topic. Um, what did Albert Speer do when he heard about it? And what did uh, Goebbels say about it? Well, of course they blamed the Jews. If this was all a Jewish conspiracy. And, and so they made, 
the response to the dam break, the dam breaching, um, a propaganda operation. Um, they said that this was, uh, uh, you know, the, the British had used Jews to concoct this whole uh, plan. And then all of the bodies, um, I think there, I've forgotten the ex exact number, about 2,000 people who had died. Every one of them, whether they were a member of the Nazi party or not, had a swastika flag draped over their coffin. So this became an entire propaganda move in response to the horrible uh, terror, terror bombers from Britain. Now, and as you rightly say, in about 76 days, uh, it was uh, rebuilt or the dams were rebuilt. So of, of the three dams, uh, were all three destroyed? No, the Mona and the Ader were destroyed and then okay. rebuilt. The so Sorpa was simply damaged. Okay, so all, all repairs are done within about 76 days, which Albert Speer was uh, good at. Um, and they are back in production. Ah, but wait, wait, one, one problem. They're not functioning because they're most powerful in the spring when the water is flooding the reservoir. After the bombs hit, the water went away. The bombs made the dams ineffective really until the following spring. Right, so there's a, some residual effect there. But you rightly say it's something, it's a, a, approaching 50% of the crew didn't make it back. I mean, the, the toll was horrific. And the question that in a way you were asking yourself, I will reiterate, was it worth it? And that's the question that people have asked for 75 years, was it worth it? And one of the elements in my research that illustrates the value of it, because it wasn't a tactical victory, uh, they lost, as I said, uh, eight crews of the 19, and as you pointed out, um, and it wasn't uh, a total uh, decimation of the dams forever. What it did was, and it was a crucial moment in the war. Remember the allies had not had many victories in late 1942 and early 1943. There had been victories in North Africa, the Soviets were turning the tide at Stalingrad, um, the Battle of the Atlantic about which I'm writing now uh, had turned, but this was the first significant moment that the allies could say, we've hit Germany, we've hit the Nazis, at the, where they're most vulnerable. Interestingly, when the crews get back to Scampton, within a week, they're paid a visit by the king and the queen. And here was the value of what they had accomplished. Not the strategic, not the damage to the dams, none of that. But when the king and queen came to Scampton and they met all of the crews who survived, almost before they were decorated, they thanked them for giving Britons hope. This was a victory of morale, not of things and munitions and, and destruction. This was building up Britons who had been weathering the war with no good news through their darkest hours. And suddenly they had a glimmer of hope. Coincidentally, Winston Churchill is in North America about to address Congress at this moment. He's actually in Congress either a day or two after the raid. And he can actually, and this is of course, just after the Americans have come into the war. And he goes before Congress and explains to Congress that the Commonwealth has been bearing the burden of the war for three years, four years. It's about time the rest of our allies joined the activity and essentially shames the American into ramping up their input for the war. And so it's a valuable propaganda tool as well, as well as a morale builder. And, and I think that's the speech in which he jokes uh, that with one American parent, had the roles been reversed and his father been uh, American, he might have got into the uh, U.S. Congress on his own as opposed to just being uh, invited in. Yeah, he, did, um, he spoke to Congress a number of times. You're right. Uh, Ted, um, there were other uh, benefits of that raid, it seems to me, that you document. One is in a, in a way took the war to the average German citizen, which uh, after the war, I think uh, John Kenneth Galbraith studied and noted that there really wasn't the rationing or the deprivation or the sacrifice by the average citizen. And secondly, probably took some um, working power. Uh, I was going to use the gender specific, uh, 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 you know, uh, man hours or something like that, but it took some work hours away from the Nazis um, uh, 
uh, special weapons, the V1, the V2, the nuclear and uh, the jet engine and what have you. Um, is that overstating it? I don't think so, Alan. I think you're right. And, and it actually uh, blossoms from there. I mentioned a moment ago about the propaganda value of draping all of the bodies from the dams raid with swastikas. Um, this, was a, this was an affront to the Nazis to have uh, bomber command roar through in the middle of the night and damage, you know, destroy these two dams and damage the third and, and, and kill all these people and cripple industry temporarily, which is why they, from that affront, focused on a response and they forced labor uh, recruited everybody, including those who were working on the Atlantic wall, the wall that was being built to protect the occupied Europe against a coming invasion they knew was going to come. So you've got workers in France and Belgium and the Netherlands flowing to the dam to rebuild the dam instead of working on the Atlantic wall, which in my assessment and evaluation gave D-Day a year later, a leg up, because that delayed functioning uh, construction of all the defenses that were being built along the coastline and gave essentially the allies a little bit of a better chance to land with less progressed construction on the coast. Now, one of the neat things about all of your books that I've read um, is that you contextualize things. And by that, I mean, you often start before the story begins and history has an important word in it, story. You start before that story and you carry on a little after that story to show more context. Well, the dam busters, uh, uh, and I won't say decimated because that's only 10% of them, but uh, almost 50% of them, uh, by this raid, they did uh, live again as a unit and had two uh, spectacular and historic uh, other missions. Could you talk about those? Well, um, one of them was a disaster. Uh, because they tried to use the same technique that they had used against the dams uh, at the Dortmund Ems Canal in September of 1943. They did low level attacks on um, an area of the canal that essentially was bringing uh, U boat parts and U boats from Central Europe to launch in Kiel and beyond. And so they found this vulnerable part of the canal, which they hoped they could destroy the same way they had done the dams. It was a catastrophic loss of many of the crews that had actually survived the dams raid uh, that night in September of 1943. That was a disaster. Later, other crews come on and some of the men who'd survived both of those attacks went on to then take on the sinking of the Tirpitz, which is the battleship that I mentioned earlier. They ultimately used a different bomb that Burns Wallace had created for that uh, called the Tall Boy. And um, um, there was another that he actually created about five or six different bombs. In any case, um, they destroyed the turpits and they were also key in the elimination of the e-boat, the German e-boat um, pens um, at Le Havre on the coast of France. Perhaps, Very important. Yeah, perhaps 130 vessels. And uh, wasn't it uh, Bomber Harris who said if this had been uh, a, a, a naval operation that would have been considered one of the most successful of the war. Yeah, Trafalgar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then finally, uh, a, a, a bit of a raid on the V-1 a bomber that was just coming into its own, or the V-1 rocket, right? Yeah, those locations were uh, obviously on Bomber Command's list of activity. But you touched on something a moment ago that I wanted to sp spend a couple of minutes responding to, Alan, and it's, it's absolutely bang on. The dams raid in my book, Dam Busters, is all finished about two thirds through the book. So, okay, where the heck does Barris go with the last third of the book? And my thesis is, were it not for the people who then took the story and preserved it and retold it and kept the elements of the original research together, including the families of the dam busters, and I haven't even mentioned at this point that a quarter of the air crew on the raid, I think I said 122 earlier, it's 133, a quarter of them were Canadians. We had pilots, flight engineers, bomb aimers, wireless radio operators, gunners on every aircraft who were Canadian. And nobody, not the movie makers, not the 
historians who've written this story pr previous to me, none of them touch on that. It's a very important element. But what happened after the war was there was fear that the story, because it had happened in 1943 and there was a whole lot of war between 1943 and 45, is that the story would be lost, forgotten. It wasn't because they got Paul Brickhill, the same guy who did the story on The Great Escape, the original draft, um, they got him to write up the story of the Dam Buster raid. He too forgot the Canadians, but there was an effort to preserve the story. Then from that book came the movie in 1955. But what I maintain is so much of that would have gone like, you know, uh, leaves in the wind and lost were it not for the families who then felt there was more to tell, including the Canadian story. And I found families and museums, including a little museum south of Calgary, a little place called Nanton, whose function is to, to preserve the story of the dam busters. And it was to them I went to get many of the memoirs, the letters, the flight logs of the story as Canadians witnessed it that have never been told before. And in nope. some cases, sorry. I, I was just gonna say, I've held this up this way several times. I'll do it this way to show that there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories in there including up into the 70s with some of the relatives. So I commend you uh, for that and the, uh, the museum in, in Alberta with a Lancaster in it. I mean, those are great stories too. Well, one of the, one of the reasons I raised that is that um, one of the problems that historians have faced in the last 20, 30 years is that some people who present themselves as historians are approaching veterans or their families on the claim or the premise that they're writing history and ask the families to hand over to them valuable details and artifacts and written accounts of their father or grandfather or brother's experience, right? Or husband's experience. And the, the veterans families quite generously offer the artifacts on the promise that they'll be returned. Too many of supposed historians have taken those documents and kept them and sold them for personal gain at public expense. In other words, part of the reason that this story can be told at all is that many of the families went to bat. One in particular, Cher Fraser, took a guy to court in England who had stolen her father's flight log to preserve the history, to restore it to its former self so that I could tell the story and others like me without its being lost to history. Yeah, it's great stuff. And Ted, uh, thank you. Very, um, very nostalgic to speak to you. I guess I first interviewed you about 40 years ago. And, and if, if, if you could just lean a little to your right, because there's a picture of your dad and, and then there's you. Is that a toupee you're wearing in that picture? No, when you see it now close up, uh, that's my actual hair ah. and my dad's lack of hair. Um, mm -hmm. And you can probably figure out that my head now looks like his then. That was a photograph that was taken when dad and I co-authored a book um, called Making Music. We did two books together. One was called Days of Victory and it dealt with veteran stories. And because of my father's passion for music and showbiz, he got the Order of Canada because of his work in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to do a book together on musical heroes and stars of the 20th century. We did a kind of um, um, an anthology or, a, or a, um, a series of biographies on all the great musical artists of the 20th century, Canadian. Well, Ted, that, that's my father back there, uh, Merchant Marines. And I want you to come back. Uh, uh, first of all, I want you to finish the story I just interrupted. My apologies. <laughs> it's youthful okay. exuberance. But second of all, I want you to come back. We will talk about our fathers who, who were in uh, WW2, your dad at the Battle of the Bulge, uh, fantastic story. So uh, finish your story and then let me thank you properly. I just uh, wanted to say that um, as you probably have experienced when you're with uh, a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister with whom you've not only had a blood connection, but a working connection, when dad and I published Days of Victory in 1995, uh, we worked together on it. If you can imagine two historians in one room with a couple of typewriters, and we were just transposing over to computers then back in the, in the 70s and 80s. In any case, uh, two people in a room trying to tell history from two different perspectives. We had great times. And when Days of Victory, the first edition of it came out in 1995 on the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, VE Day, the book zoomed up the, the bestsellers list 
um, and was on May the 5th or 6th, just before VE Day, was number one in Canada uh, on the bestsellers nonfiction list. And no prouder moment than to have my name next to my dad's at number one on the bestsellers list in 1995. Great thrill. I'll never forget it. Proud moment for me, working very briefly with your dad at the CBC, but that is another story. And speaking of typewriters, just in case you're feeling nostalgic, uh, this is one. Boy, are they noisy. Um, yes. Uh, Ted, great, great uh, stories, and thank you very much. And come on back. Uh, if we only had one of those upright pianos, a member of the WD on top, somebody down playing some tunes, and a, uh, a barkeep to serve us a couple of drinks. We could carry on, but we don't, so goodbye. Thanks, Alan, a pleasure. We'll do it again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.